This is the Dirksen Courthouse Building in Chicago, and it's mid-morning. The federal courtrooms are in session, and the building's 28 floors are at their busiest. To the east is a former alleyway. Now it's a ramp that brings federal employees down into an underground parking lot area. On this day, though, there's also a lone semi-trailer blocking routes around the lot. Inside the trailer is about 5,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate rigged with a diesel fuel timer. The model for this particular setup comes from the bomb that was used in the Oklahoma City in 1995. Only this one slightly larger and positioned to create even more destruction. The trailer was left here by a disgruntled Chicago resident who's pulling away in his truck. Two years ago, he pled guilty upstairs and he was just released from prison. And now he wants revenge. He studied the building's design and conceived his plan to inflict the maximum amount of damage possible. By positioning the explosive trailer underground, it effectively doubles the amount of damage that it will cause by reflecting forces back toward their target. The perpetrator, he's looking to destroy the eastern columns of this modern steel structure. They're arrayed in a grid of 30 feet or 10 meter squares. The north and south ends of this building are cores with elevators, stairs, and concrete shear walls that prevent the building from tipping over sideways. Each column ends in a caisson that plunges over 100 feet below the sidewalk. From this underground position, the blast would lead to complete destruction of columns within a radius of 30 meters surrounding the trailer, and severe structural damage or failure within 60 meters. The force upward on the floors would separate the connections to their supportive columns and lead to their failure. The damage to the building above would likely destabilize the core and structure enough to initiate a progressive collapse. And the same is true for the other tall buildings on this site, the Century and Consumers buildings that are along State Street. Facade damage and broken glass would be experienced for about 130 meters or about 400 feet away. These are the kinds of forces that we're talking about with these trucks or trailers that have been turned into mobile bombs. They're officially called Vehicle Borne Improvised Explosive Devices, or VBIEDs. Their power is enormous as they are, but with the strategic use of their environment, their impact can be multiplied even more. While VBIEDs aren't new, their use significantly increased during the 1960s when the Viet Cong, the IRA, and even the Mafia began using them to cripple and demoralize their enemies. These buildings were designed before all of that started, so VBIEDs weren't on the mind of the architect Mies van der Rohe as he drew up these plans. Even so, the design has certain features that will just naturally perform well in the event of a bomb attack, and some other features that definitely present some significant challenges. But first, the good. This is a rare instance where the building's blocky form and lack of decoration on the exterior is an objectively positive feature. The simple geometries make it difficult for would-be attackers to be able to hide, and then the lack of interior corners won't concentrate any of the blasts. Also, its lack of decoration or any small intricate details means that none of the pieces from those could become deadly shrapnel in the wake of a blast. Its simplicity is also beneficial for if it were ever to fail. And that's because the repetitive, simple buildings like this fail in a really known and predictable manner. Lingering zones of half-damaged buildings are really dangerous and present problems for safety crews who are looking for survivors during the act of cleanup. Another important feature for their safety is how far back they're set from the street. Originally, the intent was to enable light to be able to make it down to the street level, but safety and bomb experts call this the standoff distance, and their motto is that the further is the better. VBIEDs parked in the street will do less damage, and the open areas around the building make surveillance easier. Of course, all the glass, too, allows for security and to identify the threats earlier. But even things like the tight grid of the city streets and even the tight column grid do their part, too. Vehicles that are attempting to build momentum to jump over the curb or enter the building, they're thwarted by preventing any direct angles of attack. Then there's the service entries and the loading docks. They're particularly vulnerable with their large doors that may need to stay open for extended periods during delivery times. The loading docks for this building are located underground. And while that does amplify damage, what our intrepid attacker didn't know was just how hard it would be to get down there because a lot changed while he was in prison. During those few months, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, conducted extensive research and review of over 1,800 federal buildings in the wake of 9-11. FEMA collected all of their findings and produced guidelines for securing buildings, the reference manual to mitigate potential terrorist attacks against buildings, providing protection to people and buildings. 
In FEMA's document, they give buildings ratings based on their importance and level of risk. And for each rating category, they assign appropriate security measures for each. This building, it's a level four. That's one below five, which is the highest. That's reserved for buildings like the Pentagon, which are immediately critical to running the country. But even at level four, the protection is pretty extreme. With these changes in place now, our perpetrator's plan would have to breach at least four new layers of protection. While this includes things like the reinforcing the structure of the underground facilities, let's just start with what's visible from the outside. First is a rolling door at the mouth of the garage. This is a high-speed blast-resistant steel overhead door. It's connected to a generator to remain operational in the event of a power outage. In order to be certified by code, it must pass a series of shock tube tests. That's when the door assembly is installed at the end of a cone and then subjected to enormous blast of compressed air. Before getting to the door though, a truck traveling down this ramp would encounter the hydraulically actuated rotating wedge barrier. These are effective at stopping vehicles weighing thousands of pounds by diverting their momentum into the ground at an exact 22 degree angle. Here, it remains in its open position unless it's lowered by an attendant who's perched 24 hours a day in a kiosk with bulletproof glass. And from here, you also get your first glimpse of the extensive network of cameras that are hanging from the ceilings. These extend both inside and outside of the building, as this ground floor's main feature is the visual transparency of these enormous windows. Ideally for safety though, these windows would be, you know, a little bit smaller than this. Glass is certainly a weak point in the design, but this is no ordinary glass. It's reinforced with polymer films that are anchored directly into the structural mullions. This flexible but durable material keeps everything in place when the glass fails. And while those things are less than visible, the most noticeable change lines the perimeter of the site around the building. Through a combination of bollards, benches, planters, and fencing, there are no direct passages to the building that are wider than just a few feet. These are no ordinary bollards either. While the outside is simple granite stones, the interior is reinforced concrete that extends down a few feet anchored into the ground. The same is true for the planters. These aren't just the kind that sit on the ground. They are full-on retaining walls, disguised as innocuous containers for plants. FEMA also recommends completely hidden perimeter barriers like tiger traps. That's when a layer of foam is underground, which is designed to crush under the weight of something like a truck, trapping the vehicle with almost nothing indicating its presence otherwise. And that invisibility is of course the goal for these things, to be as inconspicuous as possible. Everything is minimized in size or disguised to appear like typical street furniture. If these security measures are too visually prominent, or if the building appears too closed off, it can give like an aggressively defensive look or look like a fortress. Like the Federal Reserve just nearby, which is enormous and solid and posing on the ground below. On the surface, this invisible approach, it seems like the best option. It's clearly the most sympathetic way to secure a building like this to live in such a populous area like a city. But the designers, engineers, and security experts aren't just doing that out of the kindness of their heart. They're not trying to be just good urbanists. When coupled with an elevated, well-maintained, and high-quality experience, it's actually part of the safety system itself. The theory behind this is called the Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, or CPTED. Its principles extend beyond the direct hardening of elements to reduce injury and loss of life. The design and the appearance of every element is carefully selected to discourage deviant behavior and would-be attackers. It's not really preventing anything, rather it's more of a deterrent. The theory begins with establishing territoriality. These elements make it clear that this area is patrolled by an attentive owner and establish a feeling of a protected territory. People are just naturally less likely to cause damage in places with these qualities. Even elements like the public sculpture participate in elevating the perception of this place. The significant cultural attraction draws a steady stream of tourists at all hours of the day and the night. Each visitor provides another set of eyes that can help identify curious behavior or deter deviant actions. If, on the other hand, it were fortress-like and rough here, it's much more likely that someone would engage in destructive behavior. There is something called the broken windows theory, which describes when visible signs of disorder like broken windows or graffiti or litter creates an environment where more serious crimes are likely to occur. It suggests that ignoring minor issues can signal that no one cares, leading to a decline in social order and increased criminal activity overall. This is a perfect example, just behind the Dirksen building on the northeast corner of the exact same block. It looks abandoned. It literally has a broken window, and it looks exactly the opposite of what CPTED advocates for. The irony, though, is that this building is part of the Dirksen building's territorial perimeter. 
Right after that plot to blow up the Dirksen, the federal government determined that this building was too close and it presented an unsecured, unacceptable risk. So in 2005, they bought the building and evicted all of its tenants. It has sat empty ever since without any plans for what to do with it or the maintenance to keep it up. Just a couple years ago, after a lengthy battle with concerned citizens, the GSA finally agreed to allow occupation. But the requirements for the new occupants are absolutely crazy. They are actually requiring all of the safety precautions of the courthouse building, like 24-hour monitored access, cameras, lights, no external fire escapes, and all renovations need to be reviewed first by the GSA. And of course, all of this comes at the expense of the new owner. Here, the needs of the city and the federal government are clearly at odds with clear, visible traces. Cities operate on freedom of movement and density and unpredictability, while safety for buildings comes from distance, sprawl, and control. These are in direct contradiction with one another. Yet as we've seen, sometimes they align perfectly. I mean, who doesn't want just a nice, clean, well-kept sidewalk? But keep in mind that behind those perks are entirely invisible mechanisms at play. You can also take the fact that these are all still standing that serve as evidence that the plot to destroy them ultimately failed. In fact, our perpetrator was being set up all along. And when he thought he was buying fertilizer to turn into explosives, he just bought a few hundred pounds of some inert fake. He was actually caught by the invisible web of protection and surveillance that comes well before the building was ever in view. When plots like this one are reported in the news, we're able to get a glimpse into that surveillance network. Just a few months ago, a plot to bomb a Lady Gaga concert was uncovered by a police operation that was called Operation Fake Monster. Law enforcement deciphered a coded language that was used in online chat rooms. Over 586 news organizations covered this story, some that never got past the suspect's deportation status, and others never got past the diversity of Lady Gaga's fandom. But with Ground News, I've been able to weed right through all that political posturing and get right to the facts. Ground News was designed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven, and objective way to read the news. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. For instance, in the Lady Gaga plot, right away you see that of the 586 total news outlets, about a quarter of them lean left, while less than a fifth of them lean right. You can also look at the factuality and ownership trends to see just how many of those sources are owned by media conglomerates. It's useful to compare the headlines, but also how the reporting is framed. That's where Ground News' Bias and Insights feature helps summarize and compare their focus. For instance, here, the left-leaning outlets tend to dwell on the targeted victims, while right-leaning ones fixate on the suspect. And that's why I keep coming back to Ground News. It provides all the tools you need to be a critical thinker. In fact, I believe in Ground News so much that I'm offering a limited time only 40% off of their Vantage subscription. You can access this discount through my link, ground.news slash hicks, or scan the QR code on the screen. So instead of just tuning out all the chatter from biased news, cut right through it with Ground News at ground.news slash hicks. I'll see you over there, and as always, thanks for watching.